Okay, in this video we're going to start uh, chapter P, section 1, and they're using P there for the prerequisites of, uh, for the class. So uh, as we go through this chapter P, a lot of it's going to be reviewed, a lot of stuff you saw in Algebra 2 and Algebra 1, and we're going to start here with just a quick review of real numbers and their properties. So what are real numbers? They are used in everyday life to describe quantities such as age or miles per gallon or population. Real numbers are represented by symbols such as uh, negative 5, 9, 0. Here we have a fraction, 4 thirds. Here is 0 0.666, uh, dot, dot, dot. That means that repeats on forever and ever. 28.21, uh, the square root of 2, the number pi, the cube root of negative 32. And then we can uh, take these real numbers and break them down into, you know, sort of subsets. Uh, the first one are the natural numbers, and that's just the whole counting numbers, the positive numbers. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, dot, dot, dot. If we add 0 to that, we get the whole numbers. I always remember, you know, 0 sort of looks like a hole in the ground, so if you add 0 to the natural numbers, you get the whole numbers. And then when we bring in the negative numbers on the left side of zero here, we get the set called the integers. All the negatives and all the positives and zero, but they're still all just, you know, whole numbers. And when we get further and further on this, you know, the real numbers, when we look at a real number line, there are going to be absolutely no gaps left when we fill in all these components. So one thing we've got to figure out here is uh, the difference between a rational and an irrational number. When is a number rational? We'll look at the first few letters here. We have ratio. You know, a ratio is a comparison of two numbers. A lot of times we write ratios as fractions. So a real number is rational if you can write it as the ratio of two integers. And the ratio of two integers, this is just a fraction. So, you know, a number like 3 sevenths or 1 eighth, anything like that, or even, you know, if you have the whole number 4, you can always put it over a 1. So here, these numbers are all the ratio of two integers. These are all rational numbers. We've written them as a ratio. A number is irrational if, of course, you cannot write it as the ratio. And it looks like I misspelled ratio there. It should be T-I-O, so don't pick on me too much. Uh, irrational, it cannot be written as a ratio of two integers. So here's our number line. Let's start filling this in from the bottom up. Um, on the very top, we see we have the entire real number line. We'll start at the bottom here. We take two things. We have zero. You know, I'll put that right here on the number line, zero. And then if we look at the natural numbers, those are the positive whole numbers. Uh, one, two, three. So here are the natural numbers. When we add in the zero and then everything else, you know, natural numbers plus zero are the whole numbers. So here now would be the whole numbers. So, and then next we would take a look at the negative integers. You know, everything we have up here, the natural number and whole numbers are all zero or to the right. Let's look to the left. Here would be negative one, negative two, dot, dot, dot out there forever. If we look at the negative integers and the whole numbers, those are now the group of integers. And again, those are just whole numbers. Now we start to look at non-integer fractions, both positive and negative. So if we start looking up here at the number line, we have these whole numbers in here and our negative numbers. There's big gaps between those whole numbers. So now we're going to start filling those gaps in with fractions. And let's just look in between uh, 0 and 1. Here's a half, uh, here's three quarters, one fourth, you know, probably right about here would be seven eighths, uh, eight ninths, we, we could squeeze it in there. As we start writing fractions, and there's many, many fractions, we're going to start filling in gaps in between the whole numbers. So we take the fractions and the integers, those are our rational numbers, the numbers that we can write as a ratio. But there are still some holes in the number line. And those numbers are, or those holes are plugged up with the irrational numbers. Uh, let's see, like in between 1 and 2 here somewhere, like around 1.7 something, is the square root of 2. You know, the square root of 2, we cannot write that as a ratio of two numbers. The square root of 2 is non-repeating and non-ending decimal. So there is a teeny tiny hole there in that number line that the square root of 2 plugs up 
just perfectly. And that would even go for, like, say, here's between 3 and 4. Somewhere right about here is going to be the number pi, 3.14159, dot, dot, dot. That is also an irrational number, and there's a hole in the number line for that pi to plug up. When we bring the irrational numbers in and we plug all the holes that the rational numbers left, we have the entire complete real number line with no holes or no gaps in it. Uh, next, bounded intervals on the number line. Um, let's see here. We have our notation. You know, A and B are the endpoints of our bounded interval, the left and right endpoints. And here we have brackets. In later ones, you'll see parentheses. The difference between the brackets and the parentheses are the difference between the inequalities less than and less than or equal to or greater than and greater than or equal to. If you have the or equal to part of the inequality, you're going to use a bracket, either a left bracket or a right bracket. If it is a strict inequality, strictly greater than or strictly less than, you use parentheses. So be very careful with uh, the notation that they use watch for the difference between the brackets and the parentheses. So here we have left and right endpoints. Our interval is closed. And the inequality we would write this as, you know, we'd have A is our left point, B is our right point. Our uh, number X lies somewhere in between. And we would have less than or equal to signs between both of them. And again, we would use the or equal to part because of the brackets. Uh, the next one below that is the same interval a, b, but now we have parentheses. And this is called an open interval. Uh, the only difference in the inequality is now we're just using strictly less than signs, not less than or equal to. When we would graph these on the number lines, of course, we're going to have a and b are the numbers that are left and right endpoints. If we have a, a closed interval, if our notation uses brackets, we will use brackets right on the graph on the number line. Maybe in uh, Algebra 2 or Geometry, if you graph something like this, you know, on the number line, you might have used open and closed circles. An open circle would have been less than or greater than. A closed circle would have been less than or equal to, greater than or equal to. And then you'd color in between them. So we're just changing these open and closed circles that you might have seen in the math class before for brackets or parentheses. And in addition to the open and closed intervals, you know, based on the, uh, the brackets or the parentheses, again, two brackets was a closed interval, two parentheses was an open interval, we could have a mixture. You know, here we have bracket A comma B. So A is still our left endpoint, B is still our right. We know that X is going to be somewhere in between. Because we have the bracket to the left of A, that tells me this is going to be less than or equal to. Because B has just a parenthesis after it, the, between the X and the B is just going to be a strictly less than sign. And graphically, of course, the bracket uh, goes to the left of A, and B has the parenthesis. And we could also reverse those now with the parenthesis on the left and the bracket on the right. A little stu study tip down here. The reason that the four types of intervals at the right are called bounded is that each has a finite length. An interval that does not have a finite length is unbounded. You can hear these were the bounded intervals, and we had endpoints A and B for each of the interval. We had a starting and a stopping point. On the graph, we started at A and ended at B. Now, here are the unbounded. So these are going to be... Uh, we're just going to have one endpoint and a direction. So here now are the notation still stays the same. We do have a parenthesis or a bracket, a comma infinity. So there is no number b that is our right endpoint. Now we can go on forever and ever. So the notation we have bracket a comma infinity, uh, and the inequality for this would be x is greater than or equal to a. You know, a is as small as we'll ever be, and we're looking at all the numbers bigger than that, from a to infinity, from a and all the numbers above a. So we would have x is greater than or equal to a. Graphically, bracket because of the, uh, the bracket in the notation, and our inequality is heading to the right. When you have your variable x on the left, and your number is on the right-hand side, here we're using a to represent our number, when the variable is on the left, the inequality is going to go the same way as the graph. Here our graph was greater than, so we are headed to the same direction, to the right. 
uh, in the next one down now. The only difference is we have parenthesis, a comma infinity. This is an open interval. Uh, and we have x is greater than a. This again stands for a and all the numbers greater than a. So we have our parenthesis and we're headed off in the same direction to the right. And as opposed to infinity on the right hand side you could have negative infinity on the left. So parenthesis negative infinity comma b with a bracket on it. So that's telling us this interval covers all the numbers from negative infinity all the way up to b. So x is going to be less than or equal to b all the way down to again negative infinity. Graphically we have our bracket at b. X is on the left so the inequality points the same way as the graph. Here we're going to the left. Another one below again another open interval we have negative infinity comma b but now with a parenthesis so the inequality is just x is strictly less than b or graphically parenthesis and then we head off toward the left of b. If our interval has no endpoints, either left or right, if we're going from negative infinity all the way to infinity, that our interval is the entire real number line. So our inequality would be negative infinity with x between it all the way to positive infinity, or we would just, you know, have our arrow going in both directions. So now we're just here in example five. We're going to use inequalities to represent intervals. Use inequality notation to describe uh, the following intervals. C is at most 2. So we know we're going to have a C and we're going to have something to do with 2. Is that going to be greater than or less than or are we going to have an or equal 2 in there? C is at most 2. So it's never going to be more than 2. So that means C is going to be less than 2. Now we got to ask ourselves, should we have the or equal 2 there? Could C equal 2? Well, C is at most 2. So that sounds like it can achieve actually being 2. So we're going to have less than or equal to. C is less than or equal to 2. Uh, letter B. M is at least negative 3. So we're going to have an M. We're going to have a negative 3. Which way does the inequality go? Greater than or less than? M is at least negative 3. So it's going to be negative 3 or numbers bigger. So we'd have a greater than sign in there. And do we need the or equal to under it? M is at least 3. So it can be 3. And... Uh, any number bigger than that. So again, we would have the or equal to under it. Uh, the last one here is all x in the interval from negative 3 to 5. And again, notice left parenthesis, right is a bracket. So we know our endpoints, negative 3 and 5. We know x is going to be in between it. And for these inequalities, it's always less than signs. So less than, less than. Which one of them gets the or equal to? The one with the bracket. And there we go. Example six, interpreting intervals. Now it says give a verbal description of the interval. So we want to sort of write this out in words like you're going to be describe it, uh, describing it to the person next to you. So here we have, you know, our left and right endpoints are negative one and zero, and we have parenthesis on either side. So this just tells us x is a number between negative one and zero. Now, it, when I say between negative 1 and 0, could it ever equal negative 1 and 0? No, because we have these, again, parentheses. If there were brackets there instead, I'd have to word this a little differently. Something like x is a number between negative 1 and 0 or equal to negative 1 and 0. Or x is a number negative 1 or 0 or any number in between, something along those lines. So let's look at letter B. We have a bracket. 2 comma infinity so that's telling me this is going to be a uh, any number between 2 and infinity and the bracket tells me it could also be 2 so the verbal description would here would be a number a number equal to 2 or greater I just want to make sure I point out that it can equal 2. It's possible this number will equal 2 or any number bigger all the way up to infinity. Uh, letter C. We have negative infinity. Remember, infinity 2, I should have pointed this out, infinity always has a parenthesis. It's never a bracket. Remember, infinity is not a number. 
infinity is a concept. So we're never going to be able to equal infinity. You know, there's always one number a little bit bigger. So here we're going from negative infinity to zero, and we have a parenthesis. And, you know, this tells me we're going to be between, somewhere between negative infinity and zero, not equal to zero. So this just tells me the number less than zero. A number less than zero. It's not going to equal zero, but it can be any number less than that. Okay, absolute value. The absolute value of a real number is its magnitude, or distance between the origin, or zero, and the point representing uh, the real number on the number line. Now here, you know, the first time I read through this, this might be a little confusing. If A is a real number, then the absolute value of A, you know, the absolute value of A, the magnitude, its distance from zero, if A is positive, the absolute value of A is equal to A. Uh, but if A is negative or negative A, that is also its magnitude or its distance from the origin. And here's probably where you'll uh, recognize more stuff that you've seen in other math classes. These properties, no matter what, this magnitude, this absolute value is always positive. Negative numbers, when you take the absolute values, turn into positive numbers. Positive numbers stay positive. So here in number two, the absolute value of negative A is the same as the absolute value of A. They're identical. If we are multiplying two numbers in the absolute value signs, we can bust it up and do the absolute value of the first number by itself and the absolute value of the second number by itself and then multiply. You know, we'll get the same answer either time. And the same for uh, uh, rational numbers, fractions within absolute values. We can break it up and do the absolute value of just the numerator, the absolute value of the denominator separately as long as it's not equal to zero. And we'll get the same answer either way. And remember, the last one here is the absolute value is your distance from zero on the number line or the magnitude. So if we let two points, A and B, be real numbers, the distance between them, we can look at it either way. We could do B minus A and then do the absolute value of it. Or we could do A minus B and do the absolute value of that answer. Either way we do it, we're going to get the distance between those two points on the number line. Okay, now uh, the next few slides here are just going to be a lot of stuff that you have seen before, just the basic rules of algebra. And this is our introductory section uh, to pre-calculus, so I want to get these ideas fresh in your head again. Uh, basic definitions of adding and subtracting. Uh, subtraction is just adding the opposite. If it's A minus B, that's the same, same thing as A plus a negative B. Uh, for division, division is the same thing as multiplying by the reciprocal. That's really handy for fractions divided by fractions. Well, let's see down here, you know, these go all the way back to Algebra 1. We have our commutative property of addition. Doesn't matter what add or order you add things in, you'll get the same answer. Same thing for multiplying. A times B is the same thing as B times A. Uh, da, 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 da. Distributive property is a big one. Remember, if you have a number times a quantity in parentheses, we distribute the number outside the parentheses throughout those parentheses. Uh, da, 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 da see what we got here. Ooh, I start number five. That must be important. Uh, so these are negation and equalities. If you multiply something by negative one, you just make that number negative. Negative one times seven is negative seven. If you have a double negative, a negative, negative number, remember a negative times a negative is a positive, so those two negative signs are going to cancel out. A negative, negative six is positive six. Uh, here, a good one too. Uh, distributing, again, that distributive property, even if you just have a negative out front. I've seen it many, many times. Students just want to drop the parentheses and make that first term, that A, into a negative. Remember, you have to distribute. Negative times A is negative A. Negative times positive B becomes plus a negative B, or negative A minus B. Real easy to forget to, you know, get that second term with the negative. Uh, da, da, da. Uh, the basic properties of zero. If you have a number a and you add zero to it, you don't change it at all. Same thing for subtraction. If you multiply a number times zero, it's equal to zero. Zero divided by anything is zero. A divide or anything divided by zero is undefined. You cannot divide by zero. And the, uh, the zero factor property. If you have two things, A times B, and you're multiplying when you get them equal to zero, then either A is equal to zero or B is equal to zero. 
Uh, the or in the zero factor property includes the possibility that either or both factors may be uh, equal to zero. This is an inclusive or, or it is the way that the word or is generally used in math. So if you multiply a and b and they're equal to zero, then a is equal to zero, or b is equal to zero, or maybe both of them are. Uh, properties and operations with fractions. Here's where it will get some people throughout the year. Uh, the first one is just equivalent. If you have two fractions that are equal, you know, that's just that cross product property. You can multiply a times d this diagonal is equal to b times c the other diagonal. If there's a negative in front of a fraction, you can put that negative with the numerator or with the denominator. It doesn't matter. If you have a negative numerator and a negative denominator, negative divided by negative is positive. So that would just turn into a over b. Uh, adding or subtracting. Remember, fractions you cannot add or subtract without common denominators. Here, the denominators are the same. So the denominator stays b. The numerators you add or subtract accordingly, a plus or minus c. If the denominators are unlike, we're going to be using this quite a bit this year. If the denominators are not the same, uh, if you have a over b plus c over d, to get the common denominator, multiply these two together. So whatever those denominators are, multiply them. Here it's just b times d. And then the numerator, it's sort of like cross multiplying. Cross multiply up this way. a times d is your first term, plus plus the other diagonal b times c b times c and then from there you can simplify we will be using this quite a bit this year uh, multiplying fractions you don't need a common denominator multiply straight across if you're dividing a over b divided by c over d remember dividing fractions you multiply by the reciprocal change the divide sign to a multiply and flip the second fraction over now it's d over c and then you just multiply straight across Okay, here's team huddle. These are just some practice problems that in class you try them with your group. If you're watching the video, maybe you missed class today. So we've gone over the lesson. Pause the video. Try out these huddle problems. Start the video back up and see how you did. Okay, let's check out these practice problems. Let me move some of these down here a little bit. Uh, in the first one, determine which numbers in the set are first natural numbers, then whole numbers, then integers, then rationals, then irrationals. And we have this list of numbers here. So the first part is A, natural numbers. Remember, the natural numbers are whole numbers greater than 0. And it looks like we just have two of them here, uh, 5 and 12. Careful, that's not a comma, that's a 3.12. Uh, part B, the whole numbers, B. Remember, the, the only difference between the naturals and the whole numbers are 0. And they're 0, so it's going to be 0 and 5 and 12. Uh, letter C. C are the integers. Remember, that's we're still talking whole numbers, but positives and negatives now. And that's a terrible C there. There we go. So when we talk about integers, now we add the negative numbers, this uh, negative 7. And we have a negative 3 there, right? Yes. Negative 7, negative 3. 0, 12, and 5. And I think that's all of them. Yes. Uh, letter D. The rational numbers. So instead of writing them all out, you know, it might be easier to say, look at all these numbers. Which of these numbers are not rational? Square root of 5. So to save uh, time here, the rational numbers are all except the square root of 5. And the last one, letter E, what are the irrational numbers? And we sort of explain that in part D. The only one there that is not rational is the irrational number, square root of 5. Oops. Uh, so let's see here, the next one. I don't want to do that. Plot the two real numbers on the real number line. Place the appropriate inequality symbol between them. So here, be careful. Uh, when I look at them, they're both negative. So here's 0, and we're going to have negative 3 sevenths and negative 8 sevenths. And you know, we'll just put them here and here. But which is which? Which of those is closer to 0? Remember, uh, the absolute value of a number is its distance from 0. So if we d disregard the negative signs, we have 3 sevenths and 8 sevenths, which is smaller. Well, the 3 sevenths, that's going to be closer to 0. So here's our negative 3 sevenths, here's our negative 8 sevenths. 
So there we oriented them on the number line. If you have to do any of these for homework, again, you don't have to, you know, put one and two, three, four, five, and try to figure out where it are. You know, just put the numbers we're interested in. You know, I just put negative three sevenths and negative eight sevenths. Uh, pro the appropriate inequality sign between them. So negative eight sevenths. Is it less than or greater than negative three sevenths? Well, there'd be a less than in there. The little alligator's going to eat the bigger thing. If I wanted to come back up here, you know, I'd have my inequality right about there. And what do we got next? Evaluate the expression. So we have negative 5 over the absolute value of negative 5. Well, the numerator stays negative 5 for now. Denominator, the absolute value of that negative 5 is 5. We have a, a fraction, a rational number there. Can we reduce it? Well, 5 divided by 5 is 1. And we have a negative to go with it. All right, I think we just got one more. So evaluate the expression for each value of x. If it's not possible, state the reason. Well, so here's our expression, 9 minus 7x. And first for part a, we're going to evaluate when x is negative 3. So for part a, this is going to be 9 minus 7x. Well, now that x is replaced with a negative 3. So 9, negative 7 times negative 3 is plus 21. And 9 plus 21 is... 30. Now we're going to do the same thing, but instead of negative 3, we're going to plug in a positive 3. So we still it's still 9x, or 9 minus 7x. So it's now 9 minus 7 times 3, and 7 times 3 is 21. So 9 minus 21, as opposed to 9 plus 21. And 9 minus 21 is negative 12. All right, those are the practice problems. Uh, the homework for this section, page 9, these numbers right here if you do not have your uh, assignment sheet from class.